All right, class, let's begin. Um, as always, announcements to start things off. Um, so, homework one was due yesterday, and uh, some of you have already submitted, some of you have decided to take advantage of the late day. Um, just a reminder of the late policy that uh, you have till tonight to submit in exchange for 10% of your points. And uh, those of you who feel kind of, you know, what do I do now? There's no homework. You're in luck. There's one more coming your way. Um, uh, homework two will show up tonight and it will feature uh, uh, questions about uh, expressiveness of linear models, about mistake bound learning that we are talking about right now. And your experiments will, will involve you implementing the perceptron algorithm and its variants. Uh, the good news about your experiments is that uh, hopefully some of the code that you've written for your homework one, you get to revisit that, in particular cross validation and such things. Uh, things will get a little bit trickier because uh, you will have multiple hyperparameters. You have to essentially have multiple loops or you have to uh, iterate over combinations of these things. But uh, think of this as essentially high, an ability to revisit the same ideas that you've encountered. Uh, no updates yet on project. Um, the project deadline that's currently there on uh, the class website, but not on Canvas yet, will get moved. Um, and I'll keep you posted. Uh, hopefully when uh, my TAs and I meet next, we'll finalize the project and we'll uh, uh, you uh, watch out for either an announcement on Canvas or more likely uh, some discussion on Tuesday. Any questions about uh, uh, any of these things? How was homework one? Was easy? Lots of work? Okay, it uh, took a long time for you or for the program? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Program was fast. Okay, good. Um, so the, the, the reason I ask is because you get a chance to revisit the same code that you wrote for homework one, you will get a chance to use it again in your project. Um, because your project will involve you using, uh, you know, training classes, different types of classifiers on the same data set again and again. So, and you get to pick and some of you may feel very proud of your decision tree code and you may want to use it for your project. Yes. Well, I guess it depends on how big the data set is because our experience in particular, I want to borrow a little data set. We have a class of exhibit in like, you know, 100,000 years or more. And it's going to be pretty slow. Yes, that's going to be an interesting uh, exercise. Um, uh, the reason I say this is uh, in the past, I've uh, used a data set of, I think, order of 50,000 examples for a project. and everyone who used decision tree was like, now what? Um, it's, and we, we can discuss optimizing your code and such things as we go along. Or you can choose not to use your decision tree. Uh, there was some other thing, yeah. I would encourage, so the, 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 so the question was, can we discuss uh, the implementation of algorithms essentially in the class, data structures and the algorithmic choice, the implementation choices. Now, I, I made a conscious decision not to do that in the class, mostly because I want to cover more topics. But I do uh, suggest we can use office arts for exactly that kind of discussion. And we have had that discussion in office arts also. Um, uh, I want to keep the implementation stuff during the, the discussion of that during office hours also as an incentive for you to come to all our office hours. And we can talk about uh, the more conceptual stuff in the class. The, the reason is essentially I've had to make a trade off. I can either cover a somewhat broad set of topics or I can go deep into implementing things. Um, unfortunately, we've had to cut down on Every year I teach machine learning, I remove one lecture because some, you know, I want to get a little deeper into something. And eventually at this rate, if I keep removing it 50 years down the line, then I don't know what I'll teach. Um, but, uh, you know, so the, 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 the goal of the lectures is to give you a high 
level overview of the conceptual part, and you can use office hours for uh, other discussions and even Canvas um, uh, to kind of uh, you know discuss ideas for data structures, implementations, and such things. Other questions? Anything on Zoom? Wow, there's a lot of people on Zoom today. Okay, um, if there are no questions, uh, we're going to go back into our discussion on mistake bond algorithms. Uh, remember that in the last lecture, we were talking about this mistake bound model of learning, where the idea is that uh, uh, it's 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 a it's a framework or it's a it's a protocol with which your learner inter can interact with data, and it's a very simple protocol. Uh, learning proceeds in rounds. In each round, the following steps happen: nature presents an example to the learner. The learner uses its current hypothesis to make a prediction. Nature reveals the true label. If the true label does not match the prediction, the learner gets to correct itself. Every mistake-driven algorithm has the same structure. The only interesting parts here are um, how does this, uh, how is the hypothesis encoded? And how does, or in other words, how is prediction done at each step? And how is uh, the update done? In particular, we looked at uh, this definition of something called a mistake-bound algorithm. A mistake bound algorithm, just to remind you, is one that after making, after uh, for, for a particular concept class, a mistake bound algorithm is, uh, is one that makes a polynomial number of mistakes, polynomial in the dimensionality, in the, irrespective of which concept it, ha it has to learn from that set, and irrespective of what sequence of examples nature presents to it. So nature can choose the in some sense, the hardest concept and the worst sequence of examples, and yet the number of mistakes it makes, the algorithm will make, is polynomial. And a concept class is said to be learnable under this model if there exists at least one algorithm that can make a polynomial number of mistakes. So now, um, uh, and in the last lecture, I said, sure, I can define anything I want. Doesn't mean it exists, right? So to kind of prove, uh, as a proof of concept that such at least some one such algorithm exists, I presented this halving algorithm, where uh, for a for a, a finite concept class, finite being uh, meaning that there are only a finite number of functions in the set that we need to uh, uh, you know that nature might choose its true function from. And let's say nature has decided that the true function is this function f. And the way halving works is it keeps track of all the concepts, the entire finite set of concepts. It initializes um, all the concept uh, a set C0 with all the concepts. And at each round, it essentially removes every function that disagrees with the current example. By doing this again and again, it keeps only those functions that have agreed with all the examples so far, right? So that is the update part of it. The prediction part of it is it has a set of functions that are currently in play. When a new example comes in, it asks every one of them, what's the label on this example, and picks the label that is most common. If one is more common than zero, it predicts one, otherwise it predicts zero. Any questions about the mechanics of the halving algorithm or about mistake bond, the concept of mistake bond algorithms or mistake driven learning? Yes. No, uh, the definition of mistake bound learning is it's a worst case definition. It's always in the worst case what happens. Yeah. Yes. In this case, you have to look over your entire set C. I never said this is a good algorithm. Uh, I never said this is an efficient algorithm. In fact, this is a terrible algorithm from the efficiency point of view. So this, yeah. this algorithm is something that is a proof of concept, but something that 
none of you should ever try to implement because it's so horrible. At every step, you have to ask every function what's the label. And remember, we might be in a regime where there are two power, two power n functions. Not, it's not going to happen. You said your decision tree code was not particularly fast. Try doing this. So it's not. It, this this is a proof of concept. This is just kind of to show that there exists at least one algorithm. If we don't care about efficiency, there exists at least one algorithm that will eventually stop making mistakes after a polynomial number of them. So does that answer your question? You look skeptical, so. Yes. Yes, number of mistakes. Yes, we, in this case, in this case and only this case, we do not care about efficiency. Okay, uh, the last thing that we did in the previous lecture was uh, to talk about uh, how many mistakes can this algorithm make? And there's a rather intuitive way to analyze this. Um, at each step, if there is an error, and I'm not going to go over the details, but if there is an error at every step, or every time there's an error, we know that the majority of the uh, functions are wrong because the majority of the functions were used to make the prediction, which means we have to remove a majority of the functions from contention. In other words, at every step, if there's a mis or at every mistake, at least half of the functions get thrown out. Which means at every update, the size of the set of the set now the set of functions keeps shrinking by half. It's a finite set. Eventually, it has to come to that one function that is uh, the right function. So if you kind of follow this argument to its conclusion, and we did this in the last lecture, so I won't do it formally again, it's not terribly hard to show that uh, the halving algorithm will make no more than log size of C functions, log uh, to the base two. So at every step you keep, uh, uh, for every mistake, you keep halving the set of functions. That's why it's called halving. Questions about this? Yeah. Excellent question. How does this relate to the number of features? I have hidden something here. It's inside the size of C. If I have 10 features and I use all Boolean functions, then I have 2 power, 2 power 10 functions. If I have 100 features and I consider all Boolean functions, then I have 2 power, 2 power 100. So the number of uh, features decides the size, not always, can decide the size of this thing. But this bound is not in terms of the dimensionality. This is still not. It does not match the requirement that we have. That is, it does not say anything about whether the number of mistakes is polynomial or not. In particular, if you have a, a function that is, uh, uh, let's say all Boolean functions, there are two power, two power n Boolean functions. And log of that to the base two is still two power n, exponential. Which means the set of arbitrary Boolean functions cannot be, is not learnable in the mistake bound model. Why? Because the number of mistakes for it to be called learnable is it should be polynomial. 2 power n is not a polynomial. So that's the connection to the number of features, which means that there is at least one set of functions, namely the set of all Boolean functions, that is not learnable. This is, we essentially are making the same point over and over again. In one of the earlier lectures, I mentioned if your true function could have been any Boolean function, learning becomes really hard. And the answer is not to consider any Boolean function as possible, but restrict the set. This is another way of saying the same thing. If we consider any Boolean function to be the uh, uh, as a candidate for the uh, true function, in this simple model, even in this simple model, the learner will have to make an exponential number of mistakes. Any thoughts or comments? Yeah. You say that it's uh, not learning, then it's like there's like no algorithm exists, right? Um, right. So, how did, so obviously the having algorithm ends up with a problem with the Right. 
the subtle point and a very good catch. So let me restate uh, or slightly rephrase what I said, which is to say something that's correct. And then in a couple of slides, I'll point out that what I said before is also right. So the restatement, the rephrasing is the having algorithm is not a mistake bound algorithm for the set of all Boolean functions because it's going to make an exponential number of mistakes. In maybe one or two slides, I'll point out that no algorithm can make fewer than having the, the number of mistakes made by having. So that's why it's the, the, the it's not learnable. Yes, same question. Very good catch. Other questions? Okay. Um, having algorithm is nice, but uh, it's kind of not really fast. It's slow. You have to enumerate every function inside every loop. Inside every, uh, whenever a new example comes in, you call upon all the functions that you have and ask them for a label. Please don't implement it. Um, on the other hand, it has this neat theoretical property that uh, for certain concept classes, in particular for Boolean functions, and this is the point I was making before, for Boolean functions, it is optimal. What that means is for the hardest concept in the class, for the most adversarial sequence of examples, the optimal mistake bound is uh, the, uh, the optimal algorithm makes the fewest number of mistakes. So no algorithm can make fewer mistakes than the halving algorithm for any set of Boolean functions. So that's why the statement that I said is uh, that the set of all Boolean functions is not learnable in the mistake bound model because no algorithm can make fewer than the two power n mistakes. And so that's the best case scenario. This is not the most uh, general definition of optimality, it seems. Uh, there is a slightly more technical and more general definition. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but basically, rather than thinking of the fewest number of mistakes, we should really be thinking about the fewest number of future mistakes, expected mistakes, and that's even harder to compute. Uh, but that's a technical point that I'm not, I don't want to spend time on. Any, uh, uh, so let me quickly wrap up the having algorithm. It's a simple algorithm that applies only for finite concept classes. And uh, conceptually, it stores a set of all hypotheses, and then it keeps iteratively pruning them till it finds the one function that, uh, uh, that that's the right one. In all cases, uh, it's, a, it's a mistake bound algorithm. It's a mistake driven algorithm. So in all cases, what it does is it gets an input, makes a prediction, and then if there's a mistake, it makes an update. The prediction is made by the majority of the current uh, functions, and the update is um, if there's a mistake, drop all the functions that made the mistake. And what you need to know is the halving algorithm makes log of the size of the concept class number of mistakes for any concept class. We have not made any assumptions about the set of functions here. Um, there's a detail about minimizing uh, the number of mistakes in the future, and that's really what we should care about. But uh, that's not. Uh, let's not worry about that right now. Uh, we can uh, come back to that point later. Any questions about uh, the mechanics? Yes. And the having algorithm, if we have that, yeah, it's basically. What is it? What is incorrect? Well, it doesn't, nature gave you an observation that it doesn't align with the true underlying function. Nature it decides the true underlying function. There is one function that nature has already chosen that. Uh, and it, nature does not have the flexibility to uh, do things like introduce noise in this case. And it does not have the flexibility to uh, uh, change the function once this game has started. Alternatively, rather than the noise, I could say any noise that exists is part of the function. So you can, there is no randomness here. It's a fixed, it's a deterministic function that cannot change. 
it could be a really complicated function. That function could itself be the product of some noisy process. But once this game starts, the function has to be fixed and there's no randomness. Again, it's a simplifying assumption uh, that we're making so that we can do a little bit of math. Other questions about Harley? So let's kind of step back on and see what we have done here. I introduced the mistake bound model and I I told you that halving is a proof of concept of a mistake uh, bound algorithm. But really I told what I, I I said that it's a proof of concept, but I didn't show you that it's one because all I said is the number of mistakes it makes is log size of C number of mistakes. And the size of C could be really bad such that even the log of that is not polynomial. So now let's look at some examples of hypothesis classes or concept classes, sets of functions where log of the size of C is polynomial. We've already seen one example where the log of the size of C is not polynomial, the set of all Boolean functions. So let's look at some examples where that quantity is polynomial. And as a result, that concept class is theoretically learnable in the mistake bound model. The first one is uh, the set of conjunctions. By that, I mean, this is a set of, uh, if you have uh, n variables, let's call it x1, x2, xn, a conjunction is just, you pick some subset of them and you put an and between them. So the label is true if every element, every feature of some subset is true. So something like maybe this thing here x2 and x3 and x4 and x5 and x100 are true. If that's the case, then the label is true. Otherwise, the label is false. So the only thing we need to do for deciding whether having what the mistake bound for having is, is count the number of functions. So the question, oh, uh, in this case, I, I did not assume that there are there's a monotonicity property. So it's also possible that you can have some feature is negated. So you can have not x2 and x3 and not x4. So this is saying the label is one if x2 is false, x3 is true, and x4 is false. So negations are allowed. So it's a set of all conjunctions. Now, the only thing you need to do with deciding whether the set is learnable in the mistake bound model is to count the number of functions. So the puzzle for you is if you have n variables, how many conjunctions can you write? If you have two variables, how many conjunctions can you write? Just two variables. I see someone with four fingers. So there's one proposal that's four. Any one, any other? I see someone with nine fingers. Let's hope the answer is less than 10 because it seems like everyone's showing fingers. Um, anyone votes for four? At least one vote for that, of course, and two. Anyone votes for three, for four? Anyone votes for nine? Two people vote for nine. The rest of you have votes? Yes? You vote for eight, eight's another proposal. No, a variable and its negation cannot be present. So if you have two variables, you cannot have X1 and not X1 because that's, yeah, yes. Can you speak up please? 16 is another option. Any other, any uh, thoughts? Yes. You also vote for 16. So there are a few votes for four, a few votes for nine. I think one vote for eight, a few votes for 16. You also said eight. Okay, you also say eight. 15, oh, come on, you just bring in a new one. <laughs> um, the correct answer is actually nine. Um, and there are two ways of showing this. The easiest way of doing this, actually, no, uh, let's ask the people who voted for nine to explain, yes. 
Yes. And there is one more. Three, two little, yeah. Well, two little, so three. Whatever. Yes. So that's the, 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 let me repeat that. So this is the way in which I would want to prove it. For every literal x, every variable, every feature, right? Every feature. We have only two features, x1 and x2. Our goal is to build a conjunction with which has two slots in it. You can either put an x1 here, or you can put a not x1 here, or you could just leave the slot empty. Right? So I'm going to call the empty thing true. True means I'm leaving it empty. Similarly, here I can put an x2, or I can put a not x2, or I could leave it empty. And the chart, I can pick one of these three things independently of the, these three things. So I have three times three, which is nine. That's one way of proving it. The other way of proving it is uh, yes. I cannot add false because if I add false, the whole thing becomes false. It's a conjunction. So th there's another way of proving it, which is uh, slightly more tedious, which is I can enumerate things. True is a conjunction because the function that always says true is defined to be a conjunction. And then x1 is a conjunction, x2 is a conjunction, not x1, not x2, x1 and x2, x1 and not x2, not x1 and x2, not x1 and not x2. So these nine functions are the only possible ways in which you can combine two features with an and. The thing that I did on the right side is not really scalable because uh, you can't do this for, if you have a hundred features if, or you cannot do this if you have n features for any arbitrary n. So the better way of doing that would be to kind of generalize this argument. So can someone who's not you uh, and not anyone who said uh, nine Try to tell me what the what the number of features should be, the number of functions should be if you have n variables. Yes, it's three to the power of n. Why? Because I have n features, and I'm my goal is to build a conjunction. So I have n slots. This slot is for the first feature. This slot is for the second feature. This is for the n minus one feature, and this is for the nth feature. Here I can have x1, not x1, or true, x2, not x2, true, x n minus one, not x n minus one, true. In each case, I have three options, and I have n places where I can combine them. So three power n is the right on. Does this make sense? Now, this style of thinking about sets of functions may not feel natural to you, but I'd encourage you to get comfortable with it. Um, because in some sense, one of the uh, things that we will encounter over and over again is the complexity of learning somehow seems to invariably depend on how many functions are there for us to pick the true function out of. What is the size of the hypothesis class? What is the size of the search space for your learner to explore? And so for, to kind of get a better sort of handle on this idea, I'll keep throwing functions at you and ask you what's the number of functions there are. Anyway, let's come back to uh, the mistake bound learning. Oh, there is a question. Was there a question? Okay. Um, so yes, the number of uh, functions is three power n. Now, remember going back to halving, the number of mistakes halving makes on this set, what's the number of mistakes? The maximum number of mistakes halving can make on this set. Um, I see you getting up to raise your hand, but I want to ask someone who's not said anything so far. How many mistakes can having make on a function class where there are uh, these many functions? Yes. Log two of three to the n, or which is equal to n log three, or which is order of n. 
right? So the halving algorithm can make a linear number of mistakes in the dimensionality. If you have n features, halving makes order of n mistakes, which is perfect, right? Because remember, for the concept class to be learnable under the mistake bond algorithm, it's enough if we can bring up, you know, bring one algorithm that makes a polynomial number of mistakes in the dimensionality. For this concept class, the set of all conjunctions, having is an algorithm that makes a polynomial, in fact, a linear number of mistakes. So the conclusion here is that having is learnable in the mistake bond. And that's your example. I think I don't remember who asked, uh, or maybe nobody asked, but uh, there's your example of a function that's learnable under the mistake bond model. Now, I think uh, there is a problem here. Having is a lousy algorithm. It's not efficient. So it's not enough to say that it's learnable in the mistake bound, uh, in the mistake bound model. We need some way of, you know, so the, 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 that raises another sort of a technical question. Sure, you showed that it can be learned in the mistake bound model. Is there an efficient algorithm that can actually match that one? These two things are different things, right? Maybe the only algorithm that can learn having uh, that can learn conjunction in the mistake bound model is having, and having is useless. So what do we do? It turns out that there is an incredibly efficient algorithm called elimination that can learn conjunctions uh, in the mistake bound model, and it is as efficient as uh, it makes the same number of mistakes as having. Elimination is one of these algorithms that. I'm not sure it deserves a name because it's so simple. So I'll give you an example of the elimination algorithm at work. And if you get it, that's great. But I just want you to remember that uh, the notation is actually harder than the algorithm. This is one of those places where it takes more effort to write down the algorithm than to actually uh, get it. So it may seem more complicated than it is. Suppose you have a function this function that we saw before that we want to learn in the uh, mistake bond uh, in this mistake bond setting. So the true function, which nature does not reveal to us, but uh, because we know certain things, we know that this is the true function. Then let's say this is a sequence of examples that uh, uh, we the, the, our learner encounters. So the notation here is this is the example, the assignment to all the hundred variables. We have hundred variables here, and this is the label. Okay, so in this case, what we can do is suppose we know that the true function is a conjunction. What we can do is uh, every time a new uh, example comes in, we don't need to worry about any of the zeros. We can just get rid of them. Any example that has a feature that has a label zero, our learner does nothing. It doesn't care. Uh, so we only are going to make updates on positive examples. And what we'll do is uh, initially, it predicts the label is one for every example. Let's say this example comes in and it predicts the label one uh, and no mistake is made, or it, it, sorry, it predicts the label zero. In the beginning, it predicts the label zero and this example came in and all the, uh, the, all the variables, that are set to one will get dropped. So basically, okay, this is for every positive example. Let's uh, let me say this again because, like I said, it's easier to complicate this than to understand it. Only those variables that are true in a positive example are going to feature in the final conjunction. Because let's take this conjunction here. The this the label the label here is a plus one. I'll get to you in a minute. The label here is a plus one. That means there is no chance this feature here could have featured in the conjunction. This is for monotone conjunction. There is no chance that that feature could have uh, uh, made it to the final conjunction because it is not. Uh, uh, it's, it has a value of zero. Question. So, so we also want to say here, yeah. So here that's why I said this is for. I'm showing you a simpler version here for where, where we are assuming there are no negations. 
so that that set is called the set of monotone conjunctions. So if this feature is zero, that cannot possibly be in the final conjunction. So for instance, from this example, imagine that everything here is zero. From this example, we know that the true conjunction has to be some contain some subset of these features and this these features, because all those other features are zero, and yet the label is one, assuming there are no negations. And so we essentially every positive example eliminates those features that have value zero, and the only keeps the features that have a value one. And doing this, if you uh, it's possible that uh, let's see, let's look at this example here. Um, on these four examples, this feature shows up. It's, it's one, so x hundred shows up here. On this, those four examples, x two shows up, and so x two shows up here. X six does not show up because it's one here, but it's a zero here. So this example eliminated x six. This example eliminates x99, for example, for instance. Uh, sorry, this one. This, uh, this example eliminates x99. Now, interestingly, just by accident, x1 also shows up in every positive example. So the function that it learns is actually x1 and x2 and x3 and x4 and x5 and x100. And uh, that's not the same as the true function that we wanted to learn. But at least on all of these examples, this function is not going to make a mistake. Any thoughts? Any comments? Yeah. You. How many examples? What is a more reasonable approximation? I am. There are a few different ways to interpret your question. So let me interpret it in one way and just give you the answer. What we know is after making order of n mistakes, it's not going to make any more mistakes. Because there are n features. And if after making those many mistakes, there are going to be no more mistakes. Now, the question, the reason I'm kind of being a little bit ambivalent here is, is not making any more mistakes the same as having reach the true function because this this instance here let's say this h is uh, not the same as the true function and now let's say hypothetically we live in this world where the learner is only presented examples where x1 is present whenever the label is one just by accident the x1 being absent when uh, the label is one would have eliminated the variable x1 but let's say it's always present as far as the learner is concerned, it's not going to make any more mistakes. Has it learned the true function? No. But does it matter? Because if it only encounters examples of this type, why does it matter? So it's something to think about. Yes. Uh, why? why? You mean mistakes, mistake bound? Yeah. No, this this cannot make. In the worst case, uh, this algorithm, how many mistakes can it make? Every time a feature shows up as zero with a positive example, it gets eliminated, and that's the only time it can make there can be a mistake. There are n features. You cannot make more than n mistakes. This algorithm cannot make more than n mistakes because there are only n features, and you can have a mistake one. If it makes a mistake on a feature once, that feature gets eliminated. So, the point that I made earlier is essentially we've learned an approximation of the true function. And the question to think about, which we won't answer now, is is this good enough? Anyway, this is a bit of a slide discussion about uh, the elimination algorithm. What I've shown here is an algorithm for learning monotone conjunctions. I will leave it as an exercise for you to think about what to do when negations are present. There is actually a simple extension to this that you can uh, use to handle negations. Let's go back to the earlier discussion on counting the number of functions. 
Now, another set of functions is called k conjunctions. A k conjunction is with n variables is uh, the following function. First, pick uh, k variables, okay, which are which we will call the relevant features. So there might be a million features, but maybe only five of them are relevant. So you pick a fixed uh, set of uh, five, okay, and uh, K is a fixed number here. So maybe five or this, you could have three conjunctions or 18 conjunctions. Now the F is and conjunction of so it's just a conjunction of all the relevant variables. So you pick a set of variables, you say that's the uh, uh, those are the only relevant features, and the true function or the function a k conjunction is simply the conjunction of all of them. So the label is one if all k of those features are one, otherwise it's zero. So the question for those of you who may not have skipped forward the slide is how many k conjunctions are there? Um, you have spoken so far. Uh, so if I have, say, five features, how many two conjunctions are there? I should do the math in my head fast enough to be able to answer that. So let's say I have three features. How many two conjunctions are there? Think about the way in which a two conjunction is con constructed. Yes. Okay, three choose two. And oh, um, the definition is not, I was wrong with the definition. It's not just the conjunction or their negation. So we are allowed to have a variable can exist or it can be negated. Oh, but yes, so do you want to re revisit your answer? You're close, you're very close. Did you want to say yes? We don't have a k here. K equals two and n, n equals three. So we have n equals three. No, we have n equals three and k equals two. So you're saying three. Oh, I see. Nine choose two. This is another option. Any other? Yes. I guess uh, we are going back to people who have already answered. So uh, I should give him a chance first. So you have three choose two times two power two. I would say two to the power of two. Okay, we have four options. Do you want, do you want to take votes or do you want to have other? I'm so happy all of you are saying in the language of choose and powers and not making me do the math. I have no idea what how to do this fast in my head. Let me kind of restate the definition of a K conjunction. You have N features, in this case, we have three features and every K conjunction is constructed by picking two of them and constructing a conjunction where we have the features, the two that you've chosen, each of which can be optionally negated. Any takers? Anyone on Zoom? <laughs> the answer is this thing here. The reason is how many ways can you pick uh, two features out of three? Three choose two. Now we have two features. We have chosen those two features. The number of the dimensionality n doesn't matter anymore. We have these two features and we need to construct a conjunction out of them. So I have chosen two features and I need to put a conjunction. Let's say I have chosen x1 and x2. 
X1 can show up here or its negation. X2 can show up here or its negation. And these choices of whether I put an X1 or the negated version is independent of whether I put an X2 or its negation. So I have two things here and two things here. So I have two times two. So that's the answer. Yes. In this case, uh, true is not an option because you have to pick a K feature. There's a different set of functions where I can say, I, there's a slightly different definition where I can say at most K, in which case zero shows up. This style of counting, again, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with this, if you're not comfortable with this, kind of think about this, try to get comfortable. When we talk about computational learning theory, we will go through this annoying exercise again of counting the number of functions. And uh, we will, uh, I, I say annoying is, uh, actually I find it to be fun. It's kind of one of these calming things you can do, but some might, some might find it annoying. So the number of K conjunctions is uh, this quantity here. And here I'm gonna make a kind of an obnoxious approximation that that quantity is roughly two power K n power k. I'm approximating n choose k as n power k because it's a polynomial. It's a kth degree polynomial in n. The lower degree terms don't matter. Uh, this gets interesting when k is much, much less than n. So imagine that you have a learning problem where the number of features is 100 million. But you know for some reason that no more than five of those features are relevant. So I may have 100 million features, but there are only five relevant features. So K can be much, much, much less than N. So in that case, I can ask how many mistakes will halving make? And the answer is log of two power K, N power K, which is basically order of K log N, this quantity here. Uh, I want to kind of spend a, a minute kind of uh, uh, kind of examining that new expression that we just invented. It's the number of mistakes having made is order of k log n. k is the number of relevant features. n is the underlying dimensionality, the number of features you're, you have invented. What having does is it's dependent strongly only on the dimension, on the number of relevant features. Okay, first of all, let's uh, step back. The number of mistakes is order of k log n. k log n is polynomial in n. It's order of, it's, it's less than polynomial in n. Which means this concept can be learned in the mistake bound model because log n is less than two power n. So that's the first point. This concept is learnable in the mistake bound model. The second point is, not only is this concept learnable by halving in the mistake bound model, halving is, Kind of remarkable here. It depends not on uh, it, it, it depends linearly on the number of relevant features and only logarithmically on the dimensionality. I could invent a hundred million features and have only five of them relevant. The number of mistakes having will make is five times log of a hundred million. Log of a hundred million is a really small number compared to a hundred million. Right? So the, the number of mistakes that the, this learner makes is strongly dependent only on the number of relevant features, which is so cool. I could keep inventing features. I don't care about dimensionality. I could keep inventing features. If the true function depends on only a small set of relevant features, halving will make will depend only on that set. Now, that's awesome. If only halving were efficient. Halving is not efficient. So question, to think about is can we efficiently learn with these many number of mistakes? But I'm not going to answer that question now. Um, but are there other questions? Are there questions about just this style counting about this idea that uh, only a small set of features may be relevant or about having and the mistake bound in such things? Yes. Sorry. Uh, 
So this is by N to K to N to Yes. Does that make it a factorial? No, it's because it is uh, it's it, 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 that's an ugly reason. The uh, the ugly reason is it's a polynomial in uh, it's a kth degree polynomial in N because of all the denominator. You, you should write out the expression and you'll see that it's a kth degree polynomial in N. And I'm just I should have written this as this should have been really order of two power k n power k. That's really what it is. And uh, I want you to think about it offline. And the way to think about it is write down the expression for n choose k and uh, convince yourself that it's a degree k polynomial. Other questions? Okay, um, in maybe we have half an hour. I want to make one more point related to mistake bound, mistake bound algorithms and mistake bound law. Notice that even in this, this bottom part of this slide, I, I kind of presented a point that is sort of interesting, which is to say that halving is a proof of concept. It shows that this, uh, this set of functions, k conjunctions, may be learnable in the mistake bound with this really interesting property where the number of mistakes does not depend strongly on the dimensionality. Question is, how do we learn uh, uh, that concept in a practical way? Does there exist a practical algorithm? So should the mistake, what form should the mistake bound uh, algorithm take in order to learn such a concept? I said I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm going to give one more hint towards that. Um, in a different year, I have actually spent an entire lecture answering that question by presenting an algorithm that can do that. Uh, if you are interested, I encourage you to look up the lecture on the Winnow algorithm, which actually can do that. But uh, we unfortunately, why did I do that? We don't have uh, time for that. There's a question. Did, do you have a question? Okay. So I'm going to switch gears slightly to talk about a slightly general point about representations. In other words, how we represent classifiers and how our choice of the classifier representation makes learning can make learning easy or hard. So it's a, a simple question. Suppose you want to learn the set of all possible conjunctions. Should your hypothesis space be the class of all conjunctions? Let me restate that question. Suppose you know nature comes to you and says, I'm picking a function that's a conjunction. And now you need to design a learning algorithm. You get to choose. Should your learner explore that exact set or something else? Any thoughts? Yes. Well, I think it depends on if I saw the result and I think it's unreasonable, I would, I would want to exclude that result in this case of this level. Like if it's a conjunction, every single one, all of them, that would be so that's a conjunction. I mean, maybe nature chose that. How do you know it's unreasonable? But that's not the question I asked. The question was should your learner explore the set of conjunctions in general? And then the further that, I would say, if there's something that I would say it's unreasonable, it's Exclude it from my group. And so I would say I'd be a taking ground. Oh, you'll you'll consider a subset. Yeah. That's a that's a reasonable point, but uh, could you that that's essentially bringing in extra information. You have made an assumption in some sense that nature has told you that uh, the true set is k conjunction. Now imagine that nature comes to you and says, I'm not lying. The true set is a conjunction. Yeah, that you don't need to make assumptions that it's a k conjunction. Now, anytime a professor asks a question like this, it seems obvious. It's a trick um, because you know the, the, this is an obvious question. Yeah, you you lose your keys in the park. Should you search for your keys in the park? Right. Yeah, um, that's really what this is. If your true search space is a set of all conjunctions, should you search a set of all conjunctions? Seems like a yes, right? Except 
for this kind of a this uh, this sort of an annoying theorem from Hausler, 1988. This is one of the first counterintuitive results that you see in this class. If you have n features, Hausler showed that if you're searching, if your true function is conjunction, and you want to find a conjunction that has the smallest number of features, meaning it does not have any extra features than what was in your true function. That search problem is intractable. It's a computationally difficult problem to find the smallest conjunction that is consistent with your data set. Even if the true function set was, even if the true function was a conjunction. Elimination may have seen, seemed like a counterexample, but it actually was not the smallest conjunction that's consistent. It had that extra feature that X1 showed up in red. So can I, the question that Fowler asked was, can I learn, can I, can there exist an efficient learning algorithm that can find a conjunction, knowing that the true concepts are conjunction with the guarantee that this is the smallest conjunction that is consistent with my data set. And he showed that this is not possible. Well, it's possible if uh, P equals NP. So it's intractable, it's computationally intractable and this is also true for disjunctions. And this to me is a bit of a counterintuitive result. It's essentially saying, if your search space is a conjunction and you want to find the true conjunction that you had, you're not going to get, find it by searching in the set of conjunctions. There is a, I mean, if you are interested in a proof, uh, you should check out Hassler's paper. It's basically uh, a reduction to minimum, the minimum set cover problem. And what it says is that we cannot learn a conjunctive concept efficiently by searching in the space of conjunctions, which is so annoying. Um, on the other hand, it opens up interesting doors. We will see starting in the next few minutes, we'll start the next lecture, the next unit, where we'll see that if we are willing to learn, if our, will, if, if our learner is willing to explore the larger set of linear threshold units, which contains among other things, conjunctions, then we can learn efficiently. In other words, what we are doing here is there is a set, this is a set of conjunctions, and there is a larger set of linear threshold units. The linear threshold unit contains conjunctions, disjunctions, and other things also. Turns out that rather than searching the space of conjunctions, you are better off searching in the space of linear threshold units or linear classifiers, because if your true class function is here, by searching in the space of linear classifiers, you'll find it. Provided we have an efficient algorithm for learning a linear classifier, right? I have not shown that yet. This is kind of counterintuitive. And the way to think about it, and I'm not giving you a proof or anything, but this, this sort of a phenomenon happens a few times where combinatorial search is intractable and we make it easier by essentially relaxing the search to include the set of real numbers. What linear classifier gives you is real numbers. And in searching in the space of real numbers makes the search problem a little easier. I keep saying searching and search problem, you can replace that in your head with the learning problem because learning is search over classifiers. This shows up in other places also when we think about combinatorial optimization where uh, um, solving certain classes of problems are easier if you ignore the fact that we have a combinatorial search. Any thoughts, any questions? When I first saw this, my mind was blown. Like this, this is so annoying. Yes. Is it linear classifiers will have larger number of functions than combinatorial? I know, that's the point. The set of linear classifiers has a larger number of functions and yet the search is easier. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. We will see. I know, right? <laughs> Yes. Who 
you know the, any function in these areas okay your linear classifier can still if you had an algorithm for efficiently learning a linear classifier it will still find it in other words why did we spend all this time on conjunctions when we could have directly gone to linear classifiers but you know if we the the, the having algorithm is a useful sort of a uh, conceptual device to ask is a certain class of functions learnable and if it says yes then we can put the effort to actually inventing such an algorithm if it says no why bother so what you need to know from this unit is you need to understand what is the mistake bound model uh, you need to know these two proof of concept mistake bound algorithms namely uh, con and having con is this sort of a um, a lame algorithm, uh, having is slightly better. Uh, but the nice thing about having is that it can learn a concept in at most log of the size of the concept class number of mistakes, which means that you need to count the number of functions in a set of functions like we did today. Um, of course, having is not efficient. It only makes sense if you're willing to enumerate every function again and again, uh, or you know, call it on every example. And what you need to know is how to apply this idea for a set of functions. So if I give you a set of functions, you should be able to say, is this learnable in the mistake bound model? Or using Harvey, for example. Um, and also it turns out, um, even for simple Boolean functions, it's probably a better idea to learn it using a linear classifier. We will encounter many different learning algorithms for learning linear classifiers. And in the 17 minutes or 18 minutes that are left, I'm going to show the first one of them. 